I am so conservative. I rationalize in my head. These are things I read. In the I'm going to talk about Willow Creek. Okay. Uh, Willow Creek, a few years back, had invited. I remembered invited. at the time when Will Rogers said, I, I don't belong to any organized religion. I'm a Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> I am so conservative. If you didn't jump to conclusions, you might not get any exercise. Welcome to the Unknown Webcast. Uh-oh, I lost everything now. This is just distressing to me, guys and gals. What did you lose? You look fine. Uh, welcome to the Unknown Webcast. <laughs> this is a safety <laughs> warning for new viewers who may not be aware that I really am so conservative and sometimes disorganized that I can't turn left even when I'm driving. It is yeah. also true that I'm theologically conservative. I want to know and believe what is true, and I'm willing to challenge my beliefs. So, for those viewers who have a fear of hearing an idea which may lead to actually thinking and testing their beliefs, no. this is a trigger warning. This is not a safe space for those who may be easily offended by having their ideas challenged or even by our satire. Today is November 24, 2020, and this is broadcast number 216. And returning to join us, uh, maybe under uh, better advice, but anyway, is... Uh, author, educator, and world traveler, Dr. David Marshall. We are looking at his book, Letter to a Racist Nation, again. My name is Don Vino, and I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach Inc. in Wonder Lake, Illinois, which produces the Unknown Webcast. And our senior researcher, co-host, and occasional COVID-19 tracker is Ron Hensel, who will introduce the sponsors of today's webcast. And here is Ronnie Baby. Greetings from sunny Florida, where the palm trees came out, saw their shadows, and now we have 12 more months of summer. Our sponsors for this version, of this edition of the Unknown Webcast include World's End Theology Outlet, your one-stop resource for half-baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone. The World's End Theology Outlet and... Guaranteed the most comfortable Bible you'll ever own, my Bible. And if you really enjoy this webcast or if it annoys you and you'd like to inflict it on someone else to ensure your continued access to this program, please go to MidwestOutreach.org, click the yellow donate button and contribute as you feel led. And don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Welcome back, Dr. David Marshall. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to be talking about his book again, and we're going to promote it at least at least twice before we're done here. Uh, Letter to a Racist Nation. And uh, I've go. been working my way through it. Uh, we have it in the description box. If you look in the bottom now, in the description box, we have I'm a link to, to it there. I'm going to expand my screen. I, it, oh, okay. The, the the book went away. I was I wanted to see the book cover more closely. Can you put that back up there? Letter. I to, I, I, I can. I, I bet I can do that. I, I I'm looking at the at the four people there, and you got. I could tell right away, even when it's tiny, I could see AOC, Obama, Trump, and that looks kind of like Ruth Buzzy. I don't know who is that with the red hat. <laughs> that is Elizabeth Warren, the famous Native oh, American oh, 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 American oh. leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focahontas. Focahontas. Fo 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 you know, lately, um, I think Ben Shapiro on his Twitter feed, uh, he he he, re he retweeted a um, uh, a notice that uh, I think uh, Yellen is it Jan or Ye Jan Yellen has been appointed Treasury Secretary, and I think that was a uh, uh, that was a uh, the office that Elizabeth Warren wanted. Uh, was oh, hoping really? for, and so uh, he re when he retweets it, he writes a single tear goes down Elizabeth Warren's face, which of course is meant to evoke that commercial from the seventies of the the Indian who turns to the camera when he sees the litter all over the landscape and 
the United States. <laughs> oh, and I know, I know, so, I felt personally guilty every time I saw a Native American when I threw something out the window. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So, anyways, she. I, I was one. I thought it was one thousand twenty fourth funny when he did that. But um, okay. okay. So whatever. <laughs> so. So David has this book. We we <laughs> talked about it a little bit the last time he was on. We spent a lot of time kind of talking about his experience, where he comes from, why this is important to him. Uh, as it turns out, he went to the same university that Robin D'Angelo attended in a different department. Uh, I don't know. Did, did you ever, like, have lunch with her or anything or wave or anything like that? She would have been a little before my time for graduate school. For As an undergraduate, she went to Seattle University, which is – as I, as I put it, a, a brick throw away from Chaz, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Ah. So she was a... Uh, and they do throw bricks there, too. Yeah, so... They do. They did throw bricks there, too. I don't. She probably doesn't have the arm for it, actually. It's probably more like half a mile away. So they didn't name Chaz after Sonny and Cher's daughter? Uh, <laughs> they might have had that in mind, but uh, it has been hidden I mean, I, from I'm the sorry, national media. Sonny and Cher's son. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I probably just offended... All the transgender people in the universe, including some in other solar systems, but I apologize. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so would you like me to put the table of contents back up as a kind of a cue to where well, we're going you, next? Well, you, you can. While I'm kind of remarking, and I told him before we started, I, you know, one of my uh, books that I really like and, and tell people they ought to read is by Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Quest for Cosmic Justice, which is, I think, an yeah. important book. It was done yeah. in about 2002. Yeah. So it wasn't written directly about critical race theory, I don't think. I mean, he may have been communicating with a professor uh, on this issue, but he covers all of the topics that are important in the discussion and demonstrates that uh, although bad things happen in this world, they happen universally around the world in a whole variety of ways for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, and systemic racism probably is not one of them per se. Now, right. David's book deals with this from a similar perspective. He's lived like more than just in one little town in one little state in the United States. He's actually been in other... What, what are the countries? Why don't you rename the countries so that people have a, a, a feeling for that, David? Well, in the UK, uh, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, mainland China, Japan, those are the main countries besides the United States. But also, I, I've always had an affinity for uh, subcultures and native peoples and whatnot. So I've spent some time among uh, native aboriginal peoples in Taiwan, living in the mountain church and, and uh, among Native Americans in the United States and whatnot. Okay. Oh, I, hear, I hear a Johnny Cash song coming on. You know, I was toting my pack <laughs> along the dusty Winnemucca Road. Not one I know. <laughs> or, not one I know. I've been everywhere, man. And then he names I've all been the, everywhere. Oh, exactly, I've been to Reno, yeah. Chicago, Fargo, Minnesota, Buffalo, Toronto. No, you've probably been everywhere outside the country, including. Well, here, if you want to talk about Johnny Cash, I'll tell you something you don't know about Johnny Cash. I bet you there's a lot I don't know. What is what? What are you telling me? This is a this is a cross cultural experience that Johnny Cash had actually. Um, the Japanese, this is a very, very, very strange story. I often tell it to some of my students. Um, you can tell the whole history of the, of the world with a McDonald's Big Mac in your hand. Huh. The, <laughs> the Big Mac recapitulates the history of civilization, <laughs> beginning with the uh, domestication of, of large grain uh, grasses in, in okay. the Middle East, which is the, uh, the wheat. Okay. In the Middle East, Turkey or, or Syria or somewhere around there. And then you get the sesame seeds from India. You get the, the domesticated uh, beef from also from the, Middle, uh, the, the Mid, Midwest, Middle East. Okay. Your tomatoes have to come from South America. The lettuce mm -hmm. comes from Egypt. And then, uh, oh, here's here. Well, here, here was the point. Here was the point. There was a oh, point. I, okay. I'm promising, I'm I, promising I like you there it was without a point. A point. I like Even it without, without a point, point yes. I like there, it was a, point. there was an, an, a Chinook Indian young man. His mother was a Chinook uh, princess. His father was an English uh, soldier or something like that in Vancouver, Washington. And 
when he grew up, he decided he wanted to know where the Indians came from. So he traveled in a ship across the Pacific Ocean to uh, Japan. And his name was Ranald McDonald. You're kidding. <laughs> I am not kidding. At that time, Japan was closed to the outside world. So he had to smuggle himself on a little rowboat in, on, into J Japan from, from the ship. He was taken captive and he was taken down to Nagasaki, Japan, which is where I would later live, much later. Mm -hmm. And he educated the, uh, a, a few people, had taught them how to, teach, how to speak English. Now, when Admiral Perry came in the black ships and opened up Japan in Yokohama Bay, they, of course, needed a translator. So one of the people that this young half Indian man had uh, educated, taught English, served as a translator for Admiral Perry in the Japanese. And one of the first questions he reportedly asked was, so where is Ronald, Ronald McDonald? How is he these days? <laughs> now, of course, you go throughout Japan and there are the history of world cuisine, world culture, world civilization is encapsulated in the big M's all over Japan. You don't have to ask where Ronald McDonald is anymore. Well, yeah, I heard uh, back in the 80s, a Japanese uh, businessman was relocated with his family to Los Angeles, Los Angeles area, as they were starting to open up all these factories in the U.S. And after they got out of LAX airport and into their rental, uh, what their kids are looking around and one of the kids says, Mommy, Daddy, they even have McDonald's in America. Yeah. <laughs> I hear it's pronounced McDonald's in Japan. McDonald's. Oh, okay. okay. Well, so that is an interesting bit of trivia, and uh, and it kind of does help us understand that uh, a lot of what we're talking about is international in scope. Uh, it is bigger than just our nation. Oh, I forgot to explain jo how yeah, Johnny Cash comes into it. You want yeah, to know okay, that? Johnny Cash. I, I was, it was great, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, so there were three... Japanese fishermen who drifted across the Pacific Ocean in a storm and they ran aground on what is now Washington State. Really? This is true. This is true. 19th true century. True story. True, oh, true 19th, story. 19th and they were century. taken captive by the Macaw Indians. They were made wow. slaves by the Macaw Whoa. Indians. Whoa. Slaves. Ultimately, okay. ultimately, they were purchased or bargained back by a comm commodore mm. of, a, of a camp, a fort, fort, I, maybe on Vancouver Island, and or maybe it was in Vancouver, Washington. And they were they couldn't go back to Japan in those days because the country was closed, but mm. they could go back to Singapore. And some of them helped to translate the New Testament. I think they became Christians. Mm. Now, here's the connection. A famous Japanese Christian writer wrote a book about their experience called Kaile. And that was made into a movie. And in the movie, the commandant of the camp was played by Johnny Cash. You're kidding. Oh, wow. you could you could find the movie perhaps. And K when K there's certain scenes in the movie where he whips out his guitar and starts playing to the, I think it was playing <laughs> to the Indians. It was a musical. <laughs> a little, little bit of music in it anyway. <laughs> Have you play? Uh, I walked a line, or you know. No, I don't remember. Ring, played, ring of fire. I, I don't I think mean, it was one of those famous. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, well, anyways, that that uh, but that story is fascinating because those two men survived on what a, a ship, a raft, or something, all on the way across boat. on a fishing boat, all the way across the Pacific. That's a miracle in itself. He it says they made the, the movie was called Kale. Kale, yeah. Haile, Haile, okay. Kai, Kaile, Kai means sea, and Le means like the ridges in the ocean, the underwater. Uh, I'm gonna have to look that up. That's amazing. Landforms. Okay, okay, so Ron, why don't you go ahead and put up so people can see what the chapter titles at least are? There you go. Okay, so we we you I think you we said you wanted to start with chapter five, demons in demand, or something like that. Uh, I I think so because we we did touch on. Um, do blue lives matter? The answer is yes, they do. Scapegoating cops and how that kind of works itself out. Is America racist? I would suggest, and, and David suggests, the answer is no. Are, are there racists in America? The answer to that is obviously yes, there are some. But is it systemic? Uh, demons in demand, I think, is a, where we want to kind of want to pick up here. Why do we have a chapter called Demons in Demand? And is there a place where you can go rent them if you need them? Mm, good question. So, go ahead. 
<laughs> yes, well, uh, I suppose if they want to run a demon, probably there's three of them here right now and on oh, no. av available. <laughs> um, demand, first of all, refers to the idea of supply and demand, that in a market economy, if you have a certain demand for something, then the supply will tend to appear. Now, my idea is that Oh, well, let's go back to this idea of scapegoating first. I don't remember how much exactly I talked about scapegoating last time, but let me give you a, a thumbnail sketch for those who maybe didn't hear the first time in any case. There's a French sociologist by the name of René Girard, and he developed the theory of scapegoating according to which uh, society, first of all, is in a condition of chaos for some reason. Or another. Maybe there's an, a foreign invasion or there's a disease, a pandemic of some sort coming into society. And so society, there's some, there's chaos in society. People are fighting with each other. There's factions and that society comes together by finding what, what Gerard calls a scapegoat, somebody to focus their anger and hatred on. Mm. They make peace. In other words, different factions in society make peace by focusing group hatreds on a scapegoat whether it's a single individual or whether it's a group of individuals. And the scapegoat must be perceived as having committed some fundamental foundational sin that threatens the, valid the validity, the solidarity of society. Now in traditional society, it might've been the Jews were poisoning right. the wells. Yeah. It might've been uh, black people in the, in the old South supposedly raping a woman or something like that black man or yeah. maybe it was there were, there were all kinds of different depends on the society which which sin or which crime would be considered the most heretical the most tantamount to blasphemy or some really terrible crime that threatens society as a whole spiritually even now in modern society i argue that that tat that paramount crime or sin is racism because of American yeah. history, because of American history and because of the, the sin of slavery and because of redlining and all the things in the past, modern American society has decided that, and also because other sins are off the list. We mm. can't say adultery is, 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 is a, is a mm. great sin anymore. Right. We can't describe blasphemy or uh, say uh, tre treachery, right. treason, cannot be the greatest sin anymore because there are, there's a certain factions in society that kind of has a leaning in those directions. So we have to find some sin that people are going to agree is really worse than any other sin. And that sin happens to be racism. And moment. so once you identify the sin and you identify the sinners, now I argue that in 2020, the police were generally taken as the paramount uh, racist in society. But before them, there were other groups of people who were tried out for the same role. You might say a certain president, perhaps. You might say certain factions, uh, political factions. But here's the, well, the demons in demand is really about the laws of supply and demand. The problem is the left is addicted to race baiting. They need a fix of white racism yeah. in order to get by like well you are one, morning one, coffee. one of the things to say here uh the supply and the the law of supply and demand creates white on black incidents from scratch and runs them viral hmm. yeah so it sounds like what you're saying is okay you, you know now gerard of course he he was 16 when the nazis invaded his country uh and I can see in the aftermath, you know, you go, he, he lived through, you know, uh, four and a half, five years of occupation. I don't know what part of France he lived in, whether he lived in the Vichy or the occupied zone. But um, so, and, and like him, you know, I grew up, I mean, we grew up, the three of us grew up in that generation that was still trying to make sense of what happened in the 40s, you know, so the 30s and 40s with the rise of fascism. Uh, in Japan, Italy, and Germany, and and then the dealing with the aftermath, the discovery of the horrors of the Holocaust, and and all that, where it's like we're still trying to make sense of it in the 1960s and even into the 1970s, 
And scapegoating becomes just one of many things we look at because obviously the Jews were the, the scapegoat of scapegoats in during the Holocaust. Um, so I, I noticed though, as you're going, you're ticking through your list of uh, societies, various scapegoats of various societies. And you know, every society faces problems and every society tries to pin the blame for those problems on some, usually somebody. But when you're pinning the blame on racism, you're not put pinning it specifically on a person unless you say all whites are the same right yeah. so in other words white especially white males i think have become the scapegoats today i think to a certain extent um there is a danger though if you're choosing scapegoats to choose a group that's too large there is a danger yes because they can fight back oh, so yeah. Ideally, it's better to focus on a smaller group than that. And if you remember, we can go back, look at this from a different angle. We can think of it in terms of Howard Zinn. Um, if you're familiar with Howard Zinn, right. Zinn uh, began to teach at Spelman College in Atlanta, a, a college founded for Christian uh, black people. And he began to realize that traditional communism wasn't really going to work in the American context. He should kind of tweak communism and focus on a different group of scapegoats, a different group of victims mm -hmm. rather than the proletariat. And so therefore uh, the focus on, on racial victims instead became very important in, 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 in a lot of leftist ideology and in, in the critical race theory and all. Now it wasn't just Howard Zinn that did right. that, but the reason yeah. I focus on Zinn is because Zinn talks at one point about the 1%. And later on, of course, we had the Occupy Wall Street movement in which the 99% occupied Wall Street on behalf on behalf of the 99%, but the the, villain, the villains were the one percent of the most wealthy. Right. Right. And it seems like even Joseph Stalin seemed to use that one percent at one point in saying that you know you have to arrest at least one percent of the population. <laughs> so it's a lot, really, for that for a country that size. So going back to our uh, demand for demons chapter. What happened is it wasn't just that now in, in, in 2020, one of the nice things about the police is they stand out as a tribe. They look differently from people in downtown yeah. Portland or downtown Seattle. Uh, they're also different sociologically. They tend to come from the middle class. Some, many of them live outside of the city. Many of them are not necessarily you know, left leaning and they're all wearing blue. So they stand out. Now, Gerard said that the, peop the victims of scapegoating don't necessarily need to be the poor, the downtrodden, the people on the margins of society, the witches, the, you know, the poor old women peddling herbs. They can also be people who are especially upstanding, especially wealthy, especially beautiful, or have some virtues as well as some, some uh, vices or de Flaws, detriments, or we yeah. weaknesses, weaknesses, yes. Right, yeah. So I think that the police very much stand in, they, they make a very good group to scapegoat in, in 2020. However, over the last several years, there have been several attempts to find other, to focus on other villains who could uh, play the role of the, uh, the evil witch or whatever you want to call them. And one of the chapters of the book describes some of those episodes, it goes through a, a series of attempts to find some horrible racist um, it's really quite ironic because some of these people, for, for example, are the famous uh, young man in uh, Washington, D.C., the, the Catholic kid, the kid from the Catholic high school who's right. wearing the Sandman. MAGA hat. Right, Sandman. Yeah, yeah, Sandman, right. Sandman. Yeah. Uh, all he did was smirk a little bit, perhaps, even if you want to interpret his expression, you know, very ungraciously. He Maybe he smirked a little bit at a Native American who was doing something in front of him. And that became a, a national issue. The Washington Post, you know, the, the, the major networks, CNN, they ran big stories about this young high school kid. Why did they do that? That was just one of many, many episodes. There was another episode in which a, a blackboard appeared outside of a, uh, an Air Force uh, Academy uh, facility for, for young people who were, who were doing taking some military training and it had some racist slogans on it. Now it turned out that the person had written it was actually African American himself. <laughs> but in the end, the general who ran the whole the whole base right. 
spoke in front of thousands of people with millions of people watching this online and 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 became be, was very very serious about this little incident now there have been a series of incidents not all involving african americans some of them involved uh, uh muslims or, or other people people of other minority groups and each one of these very petty tiny little incidents many of them which turned out to have been invented oh, yeah went viral they were covered by major networks right they became reasons for America to look deep into its soul and discern the evil that dwelt there. And right, that, right. That one, of, one of them was Aboriginal some, evil was racism. One of them was uh, there was a cement staircase, and somebody just wrote the word Trump on it. And suddenly, people were filing complaints about how unsafe they felt. This right. was like 2017, 2016. Uh, you know, and and they, there was an all-out manhunt conducted for the for somebody walking around with a piece of chalk in his hand, presumably a white male. Yeah, you know, you, earlier you said you know you're taking a risk when you uh, go after somebody who's in the majority as your scapegoat, but white males are no longer. I don't, I don't know white males if they ever were really technically the majority. I mean, I didn't say majority. I said you, a, a substantial so, minority. Oh, okay, yeah. substantial minority. Yeah, we are the biggest minority. Well, powerful. But my the first thing I thought when you said that though was, um, notice how I, it seems that they're being rather successful at going after this substantial minority. Uh, it seems that they have recruited many members of this minority, particularly those in big tech, uh, those in the media, who are more than willing to play the game, more than willing to go along for the ride, and you know, scapegoat themselves, if you will. And that's really literally what they do. They, 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 they joined, they, they set examples for the struggle sessions that they want us to all go through uh, to, to participate in. They confess their own racism. They, um, they talk about how they, they have so much more racism than they probably realize and that they're just so eager for their people, for people of color to keep on pointing out what, how they can improve and how they can do better. And they're sure that the people of color are going to find even more racism in them tomorrow than they were able to find today. And so if I were in the position of being one of these critical race theorists uh, who's promoting this, I, I, at this point, I would feel kind of encouraged. I've got most of the mainstream, the vast majority, let's say, of the mainstream media seems to be on my side. Uh, all the major social media outfits seem to be on my side. Um, I don't know. I mean, reality could change, but wouldn't you say that if, if you're in this position right now, maybe you'd, you would think you would have good reason to be encouraged that you're, you're doing a good job scapegoating white males at the moment? What you just described was uh, Robin DiAngelo's white fragility. <laughs> okay, yes. And <laughs> well, what, what I described it in what sense? That's exactly what she does in, in, in that. Oh book. yeah, yeah. She's she's one of these who she's the who probably the most famous and influential of oh, yeah. these. Oh yeah. Yeah. But I've um, seen others do it too. Yeah. I'm sure there are, yeah. But yeah. I I think that the the election that just con concluded uh, was portrayed as such elections usually are portrayed in the media as being kind of racial based between uh, minorities and the enlightened liberals who uh, take their sides out of, you know, high, high minded moral seriousness against uh, those of us who are, uh, are, are, are less progressive and, and more more, more uh, backwards. Um, the bas basket of deplorables, you might you might ah, say. I'm I'm a, I'm well, a and, and, but, I, and but, oddly enough, I'm comfortable in the basket of deplorables, and I don't really need to find a safe space because I can sort of laugh at myself when they make those sort of, sort of uh, accusations. Uh, what I do find, though, is, and, and Ron pointed this out, someone writes Trump on a stair, and suddenly they are in fear and terror, and they need to find a safe space. What happens when they go well, home, though? Let, let me let, let me let, let, him, let him finish, let finish my point. Yeah. Um, but actually, what was what's really going on in the in the election? And, and tell you the truth, I was not a huge Donald Trump fan, and, and I'm still not. He is not my kind of person in a lot of ways. And I didn't vote for him the first time; I voted for him the second time. But what happened in the second election was very much uh, a change in script. Something unexpected happened. Hmm. 
and, and just the beginning of it, maybe just the hint of it. And that is after four years of constant race, race baiting, constant propaganda on, on the racial theme, and then a, a, a grand climax in the last several months where the media has just gone overboard, never stopped talking about racial themes. Why? Of course, because yeah. the, the media wanted to get out the vote. That was part of the reason. That means the African-American vote, the Hispanic vote, even the Native American vote, or maybe the Asian vote, and also the liberal vote that sees itself as protecting the minorities. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. In fact, Donald Trump got a larger percentage of votes from Native American, from uh, Blacks right. and from Hispanics than any Republican in quite a few years. And to me, that was very promising, but it also showed that the, the actual the actual vote was more along, I wouldn't say, uh, not race, racial lines, but more along class lines. Right. And, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, traditional Republicans are rich. Traditional Republicans are, are living in the, uh, you know, they're going to their uh, cocktail parties and then they're going to the golf course and, and, and whatnot. But things have changed and the race, the, the parties have really, reconfigured themselves. So as you said, the Democratic Party, the left tends to be supported by big tech, it tends to be supported by these Amazon and the huge, huge uh, tech companies, and also some ordinary, you know, traditional companies are also supporting the, the left. Yeah. Um, but it seems that the illusion that the left is trying to, the, the, the wool that is being pulled over the eyes of, of many people in the, you know, minority groups in America seems to be breaking. A lot of people are coming to realize, hey, these guys aren't really on our side and maybe, you know, we can find common ground with uh, traditional conservatives, regardless of race, regardless of race. And, 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 and you know, that seems to be changing. People's perceptions seem to be changing a little bit. I'm hoping that will continue. Yeah, well, uh, we can, Still talk about how people, well, you know, right now, Don, they're going home for the holidays, right? Kids are going home. Well, if yeah. the government will let them. Maybe. Well, if they will let them, uh, and if if they manage to make it home, they're gonna ha they're gonna be worried because well, you know, well, the situation is well, after four semesters at your small progressive liberal liberal arts college, you're flying home to visit your red state relatives. You remember to bring your emotional support puppies. You packed your, your comfort blankets and pillows. You even remembered your adult coloring books. But it still feels like something is missing. You don't feel safe. What can you do? You need instant safe space. It has patented mm -hmm. anti-free speech technology. You are guaranteed to have protection from... From here it comes. <laughs> I think I had this problem last time. I don't know what trigger words, microaggressions, cognitive dissonance, and unwelcome thoughts. You will feel protected. You will feel safe with instant safe space from only available, that is, at World's End Theology Outlet, your one stop resource for half baked heresies, dubious doctrines, and other ideas whose time has gone. So, you know, the, here's the thing, though, Don. I think this product is actually, um, I haven't seen the demand stay as high for instant safe space <laughs> as, I, as I've seen for some of the other products, like our grievance industrial complex. Industrial complex, yeah. That uh, was yeah, and, uh, you know, where's the outrage? I think we have a lot of demand for that. And I think the reason that I've seen less demand, I'm not saying, you know, we're not selling a lot of instant safe space here, but... Um, I think the reason the demand seems to be declining is because they've managed to make it so dangerous for free speech. Uh, that well, they, they do. Um, now, there's yeah. the interesting thing is we're going through this this particular chapter, uh, kind of in search of new demons. Uh, David documents a number of claims, which later turned out to be not exactly true. Several of them had to do with uh, Islam. Supposedly, guys ripping up uh, hijabs and shouting Trump's name or you know derogatory marks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but then he cites uh, something from uh, the Is American Islamic Relations. Okay. It sounds like there's much less problem with um, 
racism and anger against Muslims than there are against Jews. Is that really? a fair assumption? <laughs> there are more hate crimes against Jews documented. Now, to what extent that reflects the actual ratio is, is another question, because of course, given the uh, horrible history that the Jewish people have had in, in, you know, with the Holocaust and whatnot, they are naturally very sensitive to hate crimes and maybe they document them a little bit better than other groups. Okay. But according to the national statistics, uh, the Jewish people have, uh, you know, suffered from more hate crimes than any other group in America, any other racial group. All right. The, the, the one that you're uh, demonstrating here is New York from previous years. 18 of 34 were anti-Semitic in nature of the hate crimes registered. Uh, five anti-white, five anti-gay, and only two anti-Muslim. Uh, one anti-black. Hmm. That's pretty astounding when you're trying to claim systemic racism across the nation. The statistics just don't seem to bear that out at all. Well, that would be not systemic racism, but more traditional kinds of racism, more personal prejudice. Systemic okay. racism, uh, by hypothesis, is a slightly different kettle of fish, but I'm also very skeptical about that. Okay. So, okay, so the incidences that are claimed tend to not be proven. They tend to actually be false, like the NASCAR driver who claims someone put up a noose in his garage, which turned out later to have been there for at least a year. Uh, yeah, the, the point there is, notice the eagerness with which the media greeted these outrages. This is very telling. And it also shows that how much demand there is for the supply that this, yeah. you know, there's just not enough supply. I'm not saying, of course, that there are no real racists of, right. of any no, kind. No. Of course, there but, are white but, people who hate blacks, black people who hate whites. But this is, I like the way you use the word eagerness, because the first uh, the first term that jumps into my mind is confirmation bias. Right. Uh, one thing about confirmation bias is it's very gratifying. It, it, it gratifies something within us. It's not, uh, we, we, we don't like to, we don't like to live in a world with cognitive dissonance. Uh, and if we, if we live in a world where we, we believe, we firmly believe that racism accounts for 99% of what goes on, but we, we lack evidence, we can't prove it, then we experience cognitive dissonance. But if we can find, if we can find evidence, even in the smallest little details of, of everyday life, then that kind of alleviates, it brings down the level of cognitive dissonance. There's, there's another point that I think is really important here. And that is, if you contrast the noose in the uh, NASCAR driver's garage or the, the alleged smirk on the high school kid's face, Right. And, the, and the big to-do that the national media made about those alleged incidents, and many of them were simply invented, contrast that with a billion dollars worth of costs to riots across America Billions. With, a thousand, with a thousand police officers or more injured, with buildings burnt down, with a CNN announcer saying there's just a, you know, a little bit of mischief here but it's really pretty much <laughs> under control with the building burning behind him yeah that's pretty astounding yeah it's it's really that and, contrast and, is really and, something and I, else to I'd tell really us like, something i'd really like to make something clear here I, I think i think i speak for all three of us when we say we are personally offended by real racism we yeah. are personally we are personally outraged i mean real outrage I have black friends, and if I believe, and I know it's happened to some of my black friends where they were pulled over for driving while black. I know that happens. I'm not denying that happens. And it makes me very angry that my friends had to go through that because, you know, uh, oh, I thought I saw your taillight wasn't working, sir, but it appears to have fixed itself. Oh, yeah, right. Okay. So I, I know this happens. I, I can name names of people who I trust. Uh, I is it pervasive? Is it something that happens systemically in the sense that this pervades the entire system, pervades the entire culture where it is a constant thing? I No, I don't believe that. And the people who have experienced it tell well, me they don't believe it either. Well, 20 years ago, John McWhorter in Losing the Race, Self-Sabotage in Black America. John McWhorter is a linguist at Columbia University and a very smart man. He was fairly young when he wrote this book. Hmm. He described uh, racism 20 years ago 
from the police. And he saw it as a, as a, as a genuine but fading phenomena 20 years ago. Um, now, my, one of, part of my perspective is uh, my brother's a police officer. Yeah. And so I have lived all my life hearing stories from him about different, you know, things in his career. And, and sometimes he can really can't, would come home really brokenhearted talking about some of the things that he'd seen. And he had to do rescues, you know, people who were in the middle of an island in the river or, or who had drowned, take bodies out of, you know, bodies of water. And right. and he worked in the downtown Seattle uh, on, on the train system there. And, you know, that was what one of the last things he did in his career. And he, you know, got in a lot of fights. He'd, take, he'd pull over drunk drivers. And uh, a lot of them gave him trouble. He said, you know, hundreds of times he would be assaulted maybe thousands of times over the course of his career. And, and I know from knowing him and from knowing all that he did, that over the course of his career, he saved many, many lives. Now, aside from rescuing people out of rivers and arresting people who are, you know, hard nosed, violent criminals, some very simple things that you think that the police do, like, you know, when people run red lights, when people don't stop at stoplights, working with the uh, traffic, off, working with the uh, highway department to, to, to change the, you know, the, the signing system and things like that. Those things and taking pulling over drunk drivers, those little things that police do, you know, they, they, they keep society safe in, in many yeah. different ways. Now, the, the notion that police in general are racist, I find very offensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a situation here that is difficult for several different parties. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a fact, as McWhorter says, that some 53% of murders in the United States are committed by blacks, mostly by young black males. Um, in the same way, in some other, some other uh, communities in America, for example, Native Americans, um, some immigrant communities, Somalis, uh, maybe some of the tribal peoples from Southeast Asia. Uh, there is also, and also maybe Appalachian whites, for example, there is a high crime and violent crime rate. If you're a police officer and you're trying to work in those communities, you're aware of those situations. And yeah. it, it's not your fault. It's not the fault of an innocent, you know, honest uh, young black man who's trying to drive to work that he gets pulled over. But I think, as a Christian, I think I should sympathize with all the parties in that sort of situation and right. recognize it's an inherently difficult situation that, that, that has to be, that the solution has to go deeper than just saying, oh, this guy is, you know, why'd he pull, pull me over? Right. Uh, yeah. And I was referring to specific instances where it might have been the second or third time that the same gentleman wearing a suit who is an employee of Wheaton College, who lives in Wheaton, Illinois, was driving five or six blocks from the college to his home. And by this time, he should be a, a known member of the community. Uh, and I can name his name, but he's passed away recently, and I, I prefer not to. Um, sure. But the, the fact is, is that uh, I, 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 if I see a, a teenager driving a car that it looks like it's out of his budget range, and he looks like he's in a neighborhood that he doesn't live in, well, you know, okay, I, I understand the complexities that you're talking about. I understand the, the layers of, of interpretation that, ha that a police officer has to go through sometimes in a split second. Um, so, so yeah, it is, it is tough. I, I, my son wants to be a police officer. He wants to get into this line of work. And uh, I, I have fear and trepidation for him. It's, it's a difficult time. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very bad time to go into it. Uh, okay, Ron, Ron, yeah. we, we just want to mention again for the viewers that we're talking about uh, David Marshall's book, Letter for a Racist Nation. Okay. Uh, they can go to the link in our description and, uh, and order that, and I would recommend doing it. It's a very, very good book. Now, one of the things that you mentioned in here is uh, in, in light of all of the things that we have fake claims of racism, uh, there seems to be a large-scale ignoring of things like, uh, you point out, Nigeria Islamist can kidnap hundreds of girls for sex. North Korea can murder Christians. China can imprison Muslim minorities by a million and tear down churches. 
Your own church may be beaten, shot, aborted, or raised without a father in inner cities on reservations or in Appalachian villages. But let some mechanic tie a loop in a garage and your news anchor uh, lights sacred fires and begins chanting nationwide exorcism rituals. That's pretty. I like that description. Uh, why is that? Is it to keep the story, the narrative alive? Well, uh, yeah, uh, obviously the, the, the dominant culture in America today is, uh, it's not white fragility, it's woke fragility. Uh, it's, well, what is the word that she uses that Robin D'Angelo uses? White, uh, well, I can't remember the term she uses. White fragility? Or no, white fragility, but it derives from, um, you know, white power. White supremacy? White supremacy, not white supremacy. She uses another term. I can't think okay. of it right now. S in any case, racism? No, no, no. It might come to me later. It'll come to me after the broadcast, of course. Of course. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so the power is not white. It's woke in, in much of America today, and especially maybe in a place like, you know, Washington State where I live. Um, all the power is in the hands of people on the left, some of them more reasonable than others. Now, they're not all, you know, I'm not going to demonize my political opponents either, uh, but also not just in, you know, red states or white, red, blue, red, blue states, but also in throughout the United States. The, the academy is basically run by people of, on the left. Um, the, the media is also controlled by the left. So, uh, now I forgot my point. Boy, I need, guess I need to be, drink some more hot chocolate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I always recommend that. Ah, get that caffeine. Oh, get those yeah. Neurons, get those neurons flowing. Oh, yeah. No, what was our point? Uh, I don't know, but while you were doing that, I was going through my copy of White Fragility to see if I could find that term you were looking for. Uh, but you, you were talking about how the power is in the hands of the left where you live, although some of, people are of, of reasonable. The woke. In fact, you have the woke fragility as one of your chapters. Yeah. Uh, not everybody is unreasonable on the left, uh, but uh, I think you were, I don't know if you're going to make a point about I was about heading, that. I was heading, and, and I was heading towards a point, but I forgot what it was now. So, so, to, so now it's pointless to pursue it's, that. Or it's, oh, it's, it's a suspended point. It's, uh, but uh, it was a brilliant point, though. I should it, point it, out it was a brilliant. Point. I, I'm sure it will. Be, I'll have an epiphany when you tell it to me. Uh, <laughs> so, in any case, the uh, woke fragility um, is is is. I mean, if if white fragility describes the reaction, privilege, white privilege. That was oh, it. white privilege. Okay. Woke privilege. Woke you can privilege. burn down buildings. You can burn down buildings. Oh yeah, yeah. If, if you're woke. Uh, Right, you you have exemption and you powerful have, statues, and, and the, the the ridiculous thing about the term white privilege is, is white privilege privilege means you're being treated special, and what white privilege means is that you're not being treated unspecial. If I understand the term correctly, in other words, uh, if I have white privilege, that means I'm not going to be discriminated against. I'm not going to be afraid of things that shouldn't happen to me. Well, anyway. I, I, think, I think on a fundamental level, we all just need to stop whining. Yeah, well, I, I agree. <laughs> I, right. I mean, we're all privileged. We're privileged to be alive. We're privileged to live in America. We're privileged to live in America. Uh, you know, it's kind of cloudy out today. It's November in Seattle, but it's. I'm going to go outside. I'm going to enjoy the, the beauty of God's nature. We're privileged to live on this planet. We're privileged to breathe air. Uh, and that's <clears throat> kind of a heart. That's kind of the heart. Of, of a very important biblical principle is, you know, the children of Israel were judged for whining. And they had everything they needed. Right. They, they just didn't appreciate it. They didn't like the manna after a while. Yeah. I, I don't want to, I don't want to become a flip side of the woke left and, and, and just say, you know, we're oppressed, we're victims. We're, you know, uh, under, under this heavy weight of oppression in the United States. We're not, you know, there are some things that are unjust and what bothers me the most is not so much anything that I have suffered because I haven't really suffered that much, to be honest. You know, I have, we, most Americans are happy to live in a country with people of other races. It adds, not right. races, but cultures, it adds our experience here. 
You know, if nothing else, there's lots more uh, choices when we go out to eat. Well, it makes, <laughs> yeah, it makes it makes it interesting. And, and, you know, there are things, as you point out, there are things we can do here that you can't even do in other countries. You can't really speak out against the government in China and get away with it, for mm -hmm. example. But, but here's where I start to get a little bit hot under the collar. First of all, I've already mentioned the police, but also here's another group of people that I think are being, I don't want to use the word oppressed, but let's use the word brainwashed this time. And that's our kids. And it was yeah. something we talked right. about already. Right. Um, I have worked in the school system and I have seen, you know, Robin DeAngelo's University of Washington uh, liberal arts quadrangle where she went to school, where she studied. And that's where I studied too. The same tuff of grass with the same cherry trees and the little, you know, I don't know if they're Victorian or what, what the, what the uh, architectural style of that, of the quadrangle is, but it's very beautiful. People come out from around the city to a special lot of Asians during the, during the cherry blossom, uh, you know, when the cherry blossoms are in bloom and they sit under the grass and people fr fr throw frisbees. And it's from that little quadrangle where Robin DeAngelo studied and where I studied that so much so many bad ideas have come, and, and there's been a change in the university. There's been a change in high schools, which, well, if we go back to Howard Zinn, for example, he did this very deliberately. He does it very deliberately, importing Marxist ideas into Spelman College, and then he went to, I believe it was Brown. You know, was it Brown or no, it was Boston University. And if you go to Boston University, well, the most famous school in Boston is Harvard University. And a few mm -hmm. minutes walk from Harvard University, there was a high school where uh, two sets of young men went to school. One of them was Matt Damon and his brother, Kyle. Mm -hmm. They went to school, you know, just a few minutes walk from Harvard University. If you watch the movie, Good Will Hunting, you can see, you know, he's going to MIT there in that school, I believe, and Harvard, all the kids were from all around those schools around there. There's another set of young men who went to the same school and uh, they're later known as the Boston Bombers. Mm -hmm. Now, the Damons and the Boston Bombers had a certain teacher in common, a teacher by the name of Larry Aronson. Larry Aronson was a personal friend of Howard Zinn. He was also the person who imported Marxist a Marxist, Marxist perspective on American history into his high school, and he taught it taught it there. And he brags it when on a website about hundreds of graduates of that high school who got into you know kind of racial grievance industry after right. they graduated from his high school. Right. It was deliberate. Larry Aronson was doing at that high school what Howard Zinn had done at Spelman and presumably has been doing it and it was doing at Brown, um, not Brown, but Boston University later on. And that is transforming the thinking of young Americans into a very antagonistic perspective, into a perspective in which they see America as a fund fundamentally bad place, as, uh, you know, very much from the critical racist theory, Marxist perspective. This is something that concerns me very much as an educator because I see the impact that that has. For example, Occupy Wall Street. 20% of the <clears> participants <throat> in Occupy Wall Street were educators in a city, New York City, where about 9% of the uh, workforce was in education. So more than double uh, the number, the percentage were from the education mm. uh, industry. Wow. I, th I think probably if you did surveys of the, the recent riots and demonstrations, you'd also oh, yeah. find a pretty large number of teachers among the participants. Just, just uh, follow Andy Nago's Twitter feed. Uh, he finds, yeah, he finds uh, not only uh, educators, but also people who've held public office or who have been appointed to certain offices or have worked for certain congressmen or, you know, people who have been in the... Um, in, in the mechanism of government. The These bureaucracy. people are not deprived. No, no, right. no. Uh, but for some reason, they think they know uh, how deprived everyone else or how certain other people are. They think they know exactly. Uh, you know, the, uh, John McWhorters of the world, I think, take exception to whether these people really know anything. So, Well, you know, one of the things that we also have is the attempted use of the Bible to make their case. Uh, which very often, if you read it in context, goes against what they're saying. It doesn't go for what they are saying. 
Uh, and so we realized that there's a need for a new product to sort of overcome that problem. Well, because uh, it's, and, yeah, because it gets kind of uncomfortable when you're, when the Bible doesn't support your views, right? Uh, you know, we all know that awkward feeling when someone in a Bible study says, I, I wish the Bible didn't have all these verses about hell. Or uh, you're, when you're having a couple's devotions and your spouse says, uh, you know, I I'm just not comfortable with uh, verses that teach a traditional view of marriage. Or when you're sitting in church and you're thinking, uh, you know, why do all the Bibles I read always have to agree with what conservative pastors are teaching? Well, that's why we're introducing my Bible. It's guaranteed the most comfortable Bible you'll ever own. We've spent literally minutes creating a way that you can have the Bible that's perfect for you. You used to have to go down some dark back alley to get a Bible like this, but not anymore. Just write down all the places where you want to make your Bible more comfortable for you and then email them to us or enter them into our handy online form. And the results speak for themselves. Yolanda from Portland says, now that I have my Bible, I never worry that my white male pastor's sermons might actually be right. Ben from seminary says, my Bible gave me the confidence I needed to drop out of my Hebrew and Greek classes. Renee from Madison said, every single one of my anti-capitalist, anti-police, and anti-social protests chants now comes from my Bible. And Buck 50 from Brooklyn says, since I got my Bible, I have no trouble basing my violent misogynistic lyrics on scripture. So when someone throws an uncomfortable verse at you, now you can say, that's not in my Bible, get your copy at mybible.cult. So, got to get well, one. So You ripped off Thomas Jefferson. We ripped it. <laughs> yeah, well, he, yeah. he limited it to the Gospels, actually. But uh, <laughs> I actually had a copy I, uh, of that once. I don't know if I had it or borrowed it. I don't have it anymore. Uh, the, the, the Jefferson Bible gospels yeah yeah so you know letter to a racist nation we're gonna again recommend you get that but i want to just turn the corner slightly about a book that would be coming out because you've already sort of introduced a topic that we have addressed previously not with you but with others and that is education you name some particular characters and the influence they've had on what we're now experiencing we can go back even to the 1930s uh, with kind of the um, creation of the teacher's college and the idea uh, uh, to use the schools to transform culture into a Marxist society, basically gradually, uh, because uh, uh, they couldn't do it in, in one fell swoop. So it's, the school system seems a way to, to do that. Now, you're, you're coming out with a book with, in conjunction with another writer on Christian education. What is that about and why is that important to consider? Let me first of all explain what the book is. The book is, I'm, I'm the co-editor with the uh, Indian philosopher Vishal Mangawadi of a book called The Third Education Revolution. And the first education revolution, the idea is that the church should be guiding education and it has in the past, as it has in the past. First education revolution was uh, the Catholic Middle Ages um, when they established universities and, and other schools like that. The second education revolution came with the Protestant revolution and later on when uh, Christians, uh, the pietists and Protestants decided that, you know, in order to understand the word of God, we needed to read it. In order to read it, we need to learn how to read, which is why uh, the Puritan colonies were probably the most educated uh, group of people in the world at the time. The third education revolution uh, is, is a recognition that we need to take back, take that back, because for a long time, for a long time, the church dropped the ball on education. You know, we let the world take over the education system. Right. Not just in America and not just North America, not even just Europe, but around the world. Uh, so we have contributors. Uh, in this volume, I think there's, let's see, there's 31 chapters in the book. Okay. We have contributors from uh, Uganda, um, Australia, India, Indonesia, Canada, Germany, uh, probably some other ones that I haven't thought of. 
and I'm slightly partly representing the Chinese perspective as well because that's my academic field. Mm -hmm. um, the goal of the third education revolution is basically for the church to take back education and a lot and along, along a lot of different fronts. Uh, you know, we can talk in, in the future about you know specific details of how that's going to that's going to happen. Right, 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 right. But we perceive, and it seems like a lot of people are coming to realize this, that, you know, how we educate our children is very important. And even Plato recognized that, you know, this is why he wrote The Republic. If you read Plato's account in The Republic and another one of his works, uh, Socrates was actually killed and he was made to drink, drink the hemlock because he objected to the way children were being educated. And he thought that the, some of the, the views of the divine, the views of God that were being taught by Plato, by uh, Homer in the Iliad and another place, Hesiod in his, his poems, were unworthy of you know, the, the, the reality of who God was. So he was made to drink the humlock. And so one of the points in the Republic, of course, there's a lot of things in the Republic in Plato's Republic that are kind of cult-like and, and, and you know, totalitarian. But there's some good sense in the book, too. Uh, it's an interesting combination of genius and stupidity. Um, Plato recognized that, you know, if a farmer is growing crops, as he put it, you know, you have to take very good care of your young plants. If you're a gardener, you know, you just planted your carrots, uh, which I did I plant a lot of carrots. I'm still picking them out of the, out of the ground e even now in November, and I probably will until February. But when you first start, now I don't have to bother with them. But when you first put them in the ground, you have to water them very carefully, especially here in the Northwest, where the summers tend to be dry and hot and the rest of the year is pretty rainy. When it's not raining, you know, you put those carrots in the ground, you have to make sure they have plenty of water so the, seed, the seeds won't dry out and die. So Plato said the same thing with, with, uh, edge, with society. When we plant those, those little sprouts that we call children, we have to take very good care of them in those early years. Others are being extremely irresponsible. And yet the church has done that. We cart our children mm -hmm. off to secular schools. Uh, you know, my children went to secular schools too, so I'm, I'm not pointing at anybody. We cart them off to secular schools where sometimes they aren't really taught. Uh, they're sometimes taught a rather warped picture of reality. Right. To give one example, uh, as, a, as I, I was... I spent many years substitute teaching here in, in the school districts here in Washington State. And one of the textbooks that they used was a book called History Alive. And I opened that, I, it should have been called History is a Lie. Uh -huh. History, History Alive is a, a world history book. And I'm a historian, so I know a little bit about history. I mean, to be honest, nobody knows everything about history. And so sometimes I feel like a bit of a fraud calling myself an historian because there's so much history to know that right. if yeah. somebody asked me, it's not like a mechanic says, well, can you fix this car? And say, oh, sure, I can fix that car. <laughs> well, if you ask me about history, I may or may not know it. But I didn't know enough when I read that history textbook to recognize that the authors didn't know what they were talking about. Everything it said, there's a whole chapter on the life of Muhammad the prophet Muhammad, as he was called. The entire chapter was laudatory and full of praise. There was not one critical word about the prophet Muhammad in the entire chapter mm -hmm. on his life. And here is a man who is, as you probably know, not really a paradigm, paragon of virtue. Right. He's a man who started wars, who raped, who assassinated, who tortured, right. yeah. who enslaved, right. and that the whole chapter was entirely positive about his worldview and about his virtues and about his moral ethics. So what did it say about Christianity? There were two sentences describing the origins of Christianity in a very objective, you know, this is what Christians believe sort of form. And then af after that, there was no more about Christianity in the early stages of, of the book nothing about the historical rise of Christianity, but there was quite a bit about Christianity in the medieval period of the book. And there was not one single positive sentence. It was all negative. It's almost like St. Francis never lived, you know? 
Uh, it was almost like the people who wrote the <laughs> textbook don't don't have a clue about what actually happened in history and what actually changed the world. Yeah. And Vishal Mangawadi, my my co-editor, is is somebody who is very familiar with what the gospel has done for India. He's written many many books on that subject, and some of them are really fascinating. I recommend them. And I have written a lot about China, mm -hmm. and I'm very familiar with East Asia. But the fact of the matter is, and this is something I'm working on another book right now uh, called How Jesus Liberates Women. The fact of the matter is, there is nothing in the world, there's no organization or concept which has transformed life in this world for women more positively than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right, right. And that would be true, not just of women, but also, you know, overcoming slavery and overcoming a, a host of evils in the world. And uh, even our, even our treatment of children has transformed by Christianity. Right. But there was not one word about that in that whole right. textbook. And then the birth of, birth of modern science in Europe and whatnot. There's not one word about that in that textbook. Well, because they've now, been told otherwise. They've, they've been told the opposite of what actually happened. Right. And they've they, believed it. Well, I don't know who they is, but if you mean the authors, Those, the, the authors, the authors, you know, yeah, and, and they at the same time they understand that most people, that people who are not as educated as they are, that means people who didn't listen to the same lies they listened to, um, you know, are, aren't ready to hear, you know, the whole story. So they'll they'll just say as little as possible. That's well, it's the, also political, yeah, uh, because they they perceive a need to suck up to the Muslim you know, this small Muslim minority, but they just perceive no need at all to assuage the, Christ, the much larger Christian minority. And I think that's partly our fault. You know, we haven't made a, a whoop de do about it. We haven't forced them to be honest in textbook writing. Now, when I say they, I don't mean, I don't mean to imply that all textbooks are as bad as History Alive. I'm sure that I have seen other textbooks that are better, uh, that are more fair well, and balanced. And another thing, if there's any group on the face of the earth that is voluntarily self-critical, it's Christians. And they take full advantage of that to, to keep on, pile on more accusations on top of accusations. So whereas, uh, you know, Chinese communism required self-criticism under Mao, even if you didn't do anything, you know, Christians look at, we look at our own history and we say, yeah, we, we're screwed up. You know, people, people are messed up, including Christians. Christians have done stupid things. We agree. We agree with that. But if you look at it on balance, what is the story? That's not the story. That's not the story. So, and uh, I, I would also put out, and you mentioned this also in, in, uh, in uh, Letter to a Racist Nation. Uh, when you look at uh, universities, you have a large and growing disparity between liberal professors teaching academics and conservative professors. Uh, it's going to be reaching like 48 to 1 in a not too distant future. Most of the major media do not actually know conservatives. They have no friends that are conservatives in their circle of, uh, of, uh, of friends uh, and those who influence their thinking. And so, in a sense, they sort of think that what they, they believe, they tend to believe, it seems to me, that uh, they are in the middle of the road on ideals, somewhere in middle America, when really they are on the far left of things. Uh, I, I have to say, some Christians do that. I used to do a, a talk I call Leaving the Christian Ghetto, uh, because we too can get sort of in this ghetto of our own making, where we don't really meet non-believers, non-Christians, atheists, liberals. I think we need to do that. We need to go out there and mix it up because otherwise you don't really know what they think. Uh, but you're proposing, a, pardon? There was a, a famous, in 1972, there was a woman named Pauline Kael. And this is a disputed uh, factoid, so to speak. But, you know, as you might recall, uh, George McGovern lost in a landslide to Nixon. And Pauline Kael was a well-known person in, you know, social social setting in New York. And she was absolutely astounded that Nixon won by such a landslide because everybody she knew had voted for McGovern. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, they, they live in this insulated world, you know, where they, well, they, they've never well, met they a conservative. When, when, 
when Carter was elected, there was a mad rush by news people to figure out what is an evangelical. I mean, they didn't even know what that was. <laughs> yeah, I remember that's, that year. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of scary. But you're proposing in, in your idea here, uh, which, again, when the book comes out, we really do want to talk to you about the book, uh, homeschool to co uh, church college, homeschool to church college. Now, we're running over time. We'll take a minute or two just so you can say, Here's what I mean by that subtitle, Homeschool to Church title. What is that? Well, I didn't write the subtitle. Okay. But the idea is that the church should seize the means of instruction. And part of that would be uh, having, working with homeschoolers and also working with uh, established Christian schools and in universities, uh, kind of a, using a blended method of learning which means that the students would be guided by an academic principal, an academic pastor, I should say, an academic pastor who would work with a local church so that education would be made available in the church. So the church would become a center of education, but also working with universities at the same time for online, you know, get the best of both worlds, get the okay. best teachers online as well. Okay. That's part of the model. Okay. Um, Parts of the parts of the program have already been implemented in in Uganda and in Indonesia, and uh, it's a very it's a very wide ranging vision, which uh, you know quite a few Christian leaders have already started to take it up, and, and and we'll see how it develops over over the coming years. Okay, all right, I, I like that I like that idea because uh, I too am concerned. I you know one of the things that we advocate Midwest Christian Outreach. One of the things that we do is we try to have Christians who are, they contact us and they're interested in missions to whatever kind of a group. Uh, we try to take them to places where they will engage and meet with people that they wouldn't normally meet. Go to the Parliament of the World's Religions. You can hang around with a whole group of Hindus there. You can hang around with a with a group of Buddhists and, and, and enjoy a meal with them uh, and find out, okay, what do you believe and why do you believe it? And then you start realizing that they are just regular folk. They're not really a lot different than you are in their desires and life. And they have different cultural aspects, but they're just human beings trying to get through life. Uh, Wiccans, even. I, 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 spend, I probably spend more time with Wiccans than maybe any other group. They just intrigue me. Uh, uh, and if, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd probably be a Wiccan. I think it's a really cool religion. It's just fun. <laughs> <laughs> how's, how's your broom? Which model broom do you fly? <laughs> yeah, well, I've upgraded. I have a vacuum. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, I and, and many of them I talked to were raised in the church. They have some experience with church, but left the church because they didn't feel like uh, it was, uh, oh, I don't know. It wasn't uh, challenging. It wasn't caring. It was, there was a lot of things that it lacked. Uh, uh, and Wicca uh, invited them to be, especially women, uh, have more control over their lives than they felt like they were experiencing in church. Several of them had been sexually abused in their church settings. And so that kind of drove them to this other uh, ideal. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's female affirming. And yet something you raised earlier uh, about uh, the role of women, Christianity changed that in the first three centuries. Uh, and... Uh, now we find we're actually moving back to devaluing women. As soon as you say, well, you can be a male and just declare yourself a female, what have you done? You've just said, well, women aren't all that important anyway. Well, and, and the whole idea of, of sleeping around and, and uh, the breakdown of the family. Right. You know, if, if, you're, if you're a mother, mm -hmm. a single mother raising your kids alone, you know, what does the feminist revolution mean to you? Right. Yeah. Right. Right, lots more right. diapers, lots more, you know, management issues. Right. And according to all statistics, the children are much more likely to have a lot of troubles when they grow up. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. You really do need a male role model. They had done, uh, there's a video, and I, I forget the title of it, but it's a, it was about a herd of elephants that were just stampeding through villages, killing uh, people sort of wantonly. Mm -hmm. It was unusual for elephants to do this. And as they started doing research to say, what they realized is they didn't, because of the hunting that was going on, most of the male elephants who would keep them in, in, um, 
under control, so to speak, were not there. Uh, and so without these male role models, they became uh, outrageously out of control. Hmm. Uh, the same thing happens, I think, on a human level. You have to have role models of both genders to grow up understanding how to even interact between genders. We miss that in this whole systemic racism, even. Yes, yes. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to imply that systemic, that, that the critical race theory or even that Marxism or even I wouldn't even say the Nazis were 100 percent wrong. I mean, there were the, the interesting thing about the critical race theories is I believe Howard Zinn and people like that or uh, Kendi Ibram, Ibram Kendi, I mean, mm -hmm. and Robin D'Angelo, they take a little piece of the gospel. Right. They take a little bit of what the gospel has taught Western civilization and they run with it. Right. But they they miss the, the totality of what is called the Tao, what C.S. Lewis and Confucius called the Tao. Right, right. All right, you know what? We're going to, we are over, and I appreciate you staying with us uh, through this, David. This is important, and I'm, I, again, I want people to, to get the book. I'll show you the cover one more time uh, before I turn it over to Ron. Uh, and uh, Letter to a Racist Nation, again, the uh, uh, link to order to, uh, in the description, uh, as well as a link to the, our previous webcast with uh, David. Uh, and I, I, I really appreciate you being with us. Ron, uh, would you kind of march us out of Let here? Let me do the, or, do the honors. Our resident cult leader profiler is Neil before me. Our wardrobe manager is C.L. It fits you. Our culinary services are provided by Chef Hammond Cheese. Our tinfoil hat provisioner is Just In Case. Jehovah's Witnesses coverage comes from Mar Armageddon and D Opposer. Our Mormon archives manager is Polly Gamas. Our Liberal Denominations Bureau Chief is Lucy Goosey. Our transgender issues coverage comes from Ben-Hur. Our special correspondent for cults based on the Hindenburg disaster and flying turkeys. Oh, to humanity. Our fact-checking supervisor is Jolie Pulling. Our technical assistance comes through Murky Research. Our legal advisors are at the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Our grievance resolution director is Yovana Pisami. Our private director of privacy assurance is wiretapping. And original idea sourcing comes from Drew A. Blank. And the Unknown Webcast is a production of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. in cooperation with Emergency Manicure Productions, both of whom are solely responsible for this content, although you will never, ever be able to prove that in a court of law. It just Never won't happen. Won't happen. It just won't happen. David, thank you. Ron, as always, it was fun. And we will see everyone else. Actually, we won't see them, but they'll see us next week. Next.